So today we're going to move on from the sacrament of penance that we have been covering the last two classes to the sacrament of extreme unction. And I think that we will have time also to cover holy orders. So, so far we've covered baptism, confirmation, the Holy Eucharist and penance. And with especially the, the last two, the Holy Eucharist and penance, each of those required at least a couple of classes. So four of the five sacraments, and today we move on to extreme unction. And that's a, uh, an interesting name. I remember when I was young, you know, t- catechism class, Unction isn't a word that we normally use, but of course that just means an anointing with oil. And extreme, we think of it as being uh, something bad or, you know, extreme uh, out of the ordinary. But in this case, it means the last. So it's really, it means the last anointing. Because the first time we are anointed is at baptism. And the second time we were anointed was in the sacrament of confirmation. And for those who become a priest, they're anointed also in holy orders. But this is the last anointing. So extreme unction is the sacrament in which uh, a Catholic, a baptized person who is in danger of death, receives the anointing from the priest. I'll give you the catechism definition. Extreme unction is the sacrament which, through the anointing with blessed oil by the priest, and through his prayer gives health and strength to the soul and sometimes to the body when we are in danger of death from sickness, accident, or old age. Now, there's several things <clears throat> that that definition brings out. First thing I want to talk, talk about is the oil. There are three oils that we use. Um, the first one is called the oil of catechumens, and that is used at baptism before the actual pouring of water. The child or adult is anointed on the breast and then between the shoulder blades with the oil of catechumens. It's also called holy oil. And then there is the holy chrism, which holy chrism is also used at baptism, but that is the matter for the sacrament of confirmation. So remember when we talked about the matter and form of each sacrament. There are only two that have as the matter of the sacrament an oil. Confirmation, it's holy chrism, and then extreme unction, it's called oil of the sick. And I I meant to bring down my oil stock to show you, but a typical priest has an oil stock, and there are three little compartments, and you unscrew it to get the one you want, and there's initials on the side. So the oil of catechumens, the initial is OS, which stands for holy oil, oleum sanctum, which is another name for oil of the catechumens. And holy chrism, the Latin would be SC, sacra chrisma, holy chrism, sacred chrism. And the oil of the sick is OI, oleum infirmorum. So we have, I get the, the oils from the bishop every year. They arrive on Good Friday. Um, the oils are blessed every year on Holy Thursday. And there's, you know how a priest has only one mass on Holy Thursday. So in a parish, there's one mass and it's in the evening. And we sometimes say the mass of the Last Supper to commemorate the Last Supper. Well, a bishop has two masses on Holy Thursday. The other one is in the morning. And our bishop usually does it at like seven or eight in the morning because At that Mass, the oils are blessed, and then he has to send them out to all the priests, and they're done overnight delivery, so that we have them for Holy Saturday, because Holy Saturday, you need them to do the new baptismal water uh, for the font, and then, of course, we renew the oils in our stocks, and the oil that's left is burned. Um, So when they're sent out, there have to be very capable, responsible persons, seminarians, clerics, who will label them because you have a big container of oil and then they fill up these vials, these bottles, and send them out. And so we keep that oil in the sacristy and every time my oil stock gets low, then I add a little, but you have to be very careful that you have the correct oil. 
So that's where the, hence the initials, because like I said, in the oil stock, there are these three compartments. So the extreme unction, the matter of the sacrament is the anointing with oil of the sick. Now you're probably aware of this fact that <clears throat> when extreme unction is given, there are six, normally six anointings, normally. So the, there'll be the eyes, the ears, the nostrils, the mouth, the hands, and then the feet. And the rubrics say that the anointing of the feet may be omitted for any reasonable cause. Sometimes, you know, you have a, uh, a sick person, uh, a person who's dying perhaps in the hospital under, you know, under covers, or maybe there's no one there to help remove the socks or whatever. So that can be omitted. But if there is danger of death and it must be done quickly, then there's just one anointing and it's on the forehead. So otherwise, normally the senses. So the priest would say, by this holy oil, uh, may God forgive you whatever sins you have committed by sight, by hearing, by smell, by, by taste or speaking, by touch, you know, the hands, etc. But if it's just done on the forehead, then you omit the mention of the sense that is being anointed. Um, another thing about extreme unction, it can only be given to someone who has attained the age of reason. So if you have a child below the age of reason who is dying is in danger of death, the priest cannot give that child extreme unction. Um, we would use, there's a blessing in the ritual that is a blessing for sick persons, but it's not a sacrament. It's a blessing. And I had a case like that quite a few years ago uh, down in Louisiana. And there was this little girl that fell into the swimming pool, Thanksgiving Day of all days, so visiting the grandma or some relative. And of course, down there, um, you know, it can be real nice weather in November. So it was in Louisiana and she fell in the swimming pool and basically drowned practically. So she was in the emergency room or in the hospital, you know, and I was called there and there was a tube down and you could see the water coming out and I couldn't anoint her because she was two years old or two and a half. So I gave her a blessing and the doctors were worried that even if she lived, there would be brain damage and there was no damage at all. I mean, she, she pulled through fine. I saw her, oh, a number of years ago, I was down there and she was like 21 or 22 at the time and no problems at all. You know, little children can be pretty resilient, but, um, I couldn't anoint her. I give her a blessing for a sick person, blessing for a sick child, which is in the ritual. So that's another point to be considered. And there was a couple other things from the definition. It says danger of death. Now the oil, the ex, the sacrament of extreme unction is given. There has to be danger of death and the danger of death must arise from one of three causes. As the, the catechism says, sickness, which is, you know, most likely going to be the cause, accident, or old age. And a, an interesting thing about that, if you had, for example, a criminal who was on death row and he was condemned to be uh, put to death, uh, you know, now, nowadays I think they use a lethal injection most of the time. So he's going to be put to death and he's been in prison for, you know, five years or whatever and he's sentenced to death and he goes back to his faith. You know, it was away from his faith and he's truly repentant and he's receiving the sacraments. The chaplain of the prison visits him and so forth. He could not be anointed even a minute before the lethal injection is going to be given because the death, the danger of death does not arise from one of those three causes. It must arise from one of those three causes. Another example would be a soldier going into battle in a war, even a very dangerous battle. He wouldn't be anointed because right now he's not in danger of death from sickness, accident, or old age. So that's very important. The, the cause must come under one of those three headings. And, you know, with, regarding old age, um, it reminds me of the story when I, my younger days as a priest, when I traveled around a lot, uh, I would go, one of the places I would go was New Orleans. And of course there was Marjorie Walters. And Marjorie Walters was in a wheelchair, but her mother was there with her, Pearl. And Pearl was... Um, you know, frail, but she was, she was fairly lively 
And she was probably mid-80s. And one time I was there and I said, Marjorie, your mother seems to have lost a step. She's just not the same. Doesn't seem the same to me. I think it'd be a good idea to anoint her. Now, she had always been in very good health, even though she was mid-80s, you know. But I just could notice that, that it wasn't the same vitality that there had always been. If I mentioned that to Marjorie, she said, well, I'll ask her. She did, and her mother said, yes, she would like to be anointed. I anointed her. Well, she died before I went there the next time. So, you know, it was providential that I just noticed that. And the cause was old age, because there was nothing apparently wrong with her other than I, I could just sense that from the number of times I visited her. So any one of those three, sickness, accident, or old age, causes. So let me repeat the definition to make sure I didn't miss any uh, other explanation. So extreme unction is the sacrament, which through the anointing with blessed oil by the priest and through his prayer gives health and strength to the soul and sometimes to the body, when we are in danger of death from sickness, accident, or old age. So that's another thing. What it does, primarily, it brings health and strength to the soul, but sometimes also to the body. In fact, often you see at least somewhat of reviving of the person of, of um, the person's strength or vitality. So sometimes to the body as well. It um, reminds me of another story. It was kind of a kind of sad, not not completely sad, but there was a man in Chicago. It was another place I used to go to, and um, he had been. He was a veteran from World War II, and his sister told me that he had cancer. And you know, I went there and I I did everything I did to try and convince him. Why don't you let me anoint you? Oh, no, 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 I'm fine. The doctor says my vital signs are good, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he was like in dreamland. And of course, he did die. I don't know if it was before the next time or the following time. But he consistently refused to be anointed. And there's a couple reasons behind that. Um, one of them is that a lot of people have this idea that if the priest anoints you, you're going to die. And it's going to happen soon. I had a case like that in Boston just a few years ago. There was this woman whom the sisters visited, and she was like, you know, 80s or whatever. And she wanted me to anoint her, but her daughter was absolutely, absolutely opposed to it. Vehemently opposed. Because she thought if I anointed her, then her mother was going to die. Which is, you know, it just shows a lack of education. But some misinformed Catholics or poorly instructed Catholics think that. They think, oh, if the priest, don't call the priest, because if you do, you're, you're going to die. So, but the good part about the man in Chicago that I mentioned was he was a very good Catholic. He very, and you know, regularly received the sacraments every time we were there and was very faithful coming to Mass. And, you know, so I, I had great confidence in his disposition, but he just didn't want to be anointed. Some people had that idea. If you're anointed, you know, you're not going to pull through. You're going to die. And you're going to die soon. If the priest comes, you're, you know, you're, you're going to die almost right away afterwards. Very strange. Uh, to me, it seems strange. But that's kind of a way some people think. But the primary uh, benefit, of course, is the soul. So let me read that. This is another question here. This is very good, very important. What are the effects? Because remember, every sacrament has different effects that it brings about according to the purpose of that sacrament. So the effects of extreme unction are first, an increase of sanctifying grace. Second, comfort in sickness and strength against temptation. And third, preparation for entrance into heaven by the remission of our venial sins and the cleansing of our souls from the remains of sin. I think it was just last class, wasn't it? We talked about temporal punishment due to sin and then that got into indulgences. But we have that temporal punishment. So extreme unction takes away a lot of that. And fourth, health of soul when it is, health of body when it is good for the soul. When it is good for the soul. Uh, oftentimes that happens. Now, this, this idea of health to the body 
if it is God's will and if it's for the good of the person, uh, will not happen normally if extremunction is delayed until the person is is very close to death. So if someone is in danger of death, you don't want to wait to call the priest for several reasons. First of all, there's going to be more benefit if the person is conscious uh, of what's going on. If the person is, is kind of a, you know, in a comatose, uh, unaware of what's going on, sure, the, there'll be graces from the sacrament, but it won't be what it was if the person is be able to be aware and the priest can talk to the person and the person is praying as he or she is being anointed, etc. So you don't want to wait until the last extremity before calling a priest to administer extra unction to someone. Now, this idea of health of the soul, of course, um, the danger of death is a time when... Now, now this, is, this is interesting. You know, in the church's prayers, we always pray from a sudden and unprovided death, deliver me, O Lord, deliver us, O Lord. That's a frequent prayer. It's in the litany of the saints, but it's in many other places, in the liturgy or in masses, etc. So we pray to be delivered from a sudden and unprovided death. But there have been holy persons who prayed for a sudden death. So the bad thing is not a sudden death. It's sudden and unprovided, mean unprepared for. But a sudden death is not such a bad thing, especially if a person is living a holy life. Now, one that I know because I read his life that he prayed for this was Pope Pius XI. Now, he died in 1939, February of 1939, and he didn't get hit the sudden death that he prayed for. But he prayed for that, and then you might think, well, why? Well, the reason is the devil doesn't know the future. So the devil doesn't know when we're going to die. And if I you know, I'm in good health today, but I die tomorrow in, you know, God forbid, a car crash or whatever. Um, the devil doesn't know that. But if a person has cancer or, you know, some kind of a disease, that's not only uh, known to the person and the family members, but the devil also can see that. He knows that because that's, you know, apparent. So he'll know that this person's time is short and the devil brings all his assaults on a person when that person is close, close to death because it's, it's his last chance to get that soul. So he's going to throw everything he has at that person. And that's why extra unction is so important because it's a sacrament that gives that special help, that special grace to prepare for death. And, and this is very important, to help the person be resigned to God's holy will to accept death, to be conformed to God's holy will. So uh, very, very important. All the benefits that come to the soul. Let me read them again. You know, the effects of the sacrament that first of all, an increase of sanctifying grace. Second, the comfort in sickness. You know, a lot of people, they, they're aware that they're dying and they're very, very disturbed, very um, uh, agitated because we're, we're afraid of judgment. You know, we don't want to die, number one. And number two, especially, we don't know what our judgment will be like. We can have a pretty good idea, but God is very strict and just and fair in the judgment. But every, like our Lord said, we must render an account for every idle word, let alone every, you know, misdeed and so forth. So um, this causes some people, people to be agitated needless to say. And I have seen it where persons who were dying in danger of death, very agitated. And then after anointing, they completely calmed down. They were, they were just like totally different. A change came over them. So this is an important effect, comfort in sickness and strength against temptation. All those, those, those extra assaults of the devil at the time when we're, when we're close to death, um, th that's something that, uh, we need extra grace to help us with. So God, our Lord gave us a sacrament. Third preparation for entrance into heaven by remission of temporal punishment due to our sins, as well as remission of any venial sins we may have. And then fourth health of the body, if it is good for the soul. Now, um, this brings up, um, another point, um, on 
um, remission of sin. What if you have a person, and of course every priest has had many people like this that he's anointed, a person has a sudden accident or something happens where you're called to anoint that person and the person is not conscious. So we have to have an intention to receive a sacrament. Right To be able to receive the graces, we have to want to receive it. So the intention of the person is, if that person had the intention and the desire to live and die as a Catholic, you know, this is a person who practiced his or her faith, um, then the priest could, could give that person extreme unction. Um, what if the person even had a mortal sin on his soul? And the person is alive, but not conscious. And the priest came to anoint the person. That extreme unction would remove even the mortal sin if the person had at least imperfect contrition before he became unconscious. Okay, at least imperfect contrition. Then the the sacrament of extreme unction would would absolve that mortal sin as well as remove venial sins. So a lot of a lot of blessings that come from this sacrament. And again, we don't want to delay in receiving it. Uh, let's see. How should we prepare for extreme unction? We should prepare for extreme unction by a good confession, by acts of faith, hope, and charity, and especially resignation to the will of God. And anytime I anoint someone who is conscious, I, and unless I've already done that before, but I will usually always talk about that, the importance of accepting God's will and praying for the grace to be resigned to God's holy will, reminding ourselves that God loves us. He is our heavenly father, and we shouldn't fear um, the, the death that comes. Even though human nature cringes uh, from death, we should accept it. And of course, as you know, I'm sure you all know this, that there is a plenary indulgence granted that is applied at the moment of death for someone who makes a... Uh, and by an act of the will, an act of resignation to one's death. To say, dear God, I accept whatever death you send me and whenever it may come and whatever be the circumstances, not knowing them, I accept all of that in advance. Very, very pleasing to God. And it was Pope St. Pius X who granted a plenary indulgence to that act. So we can make it, we can renew it from time to time. And as long as we uh, persevere in that attitude, then at the moment of death, that plenary indulgence is applied. So that's a very wonderful thing to make, an act of accepting. Even though we may not want it, but we accept our death. God knows what it's going to be. God knows with each of us when we will die, what the circumstances will be, what the cause of death will be, how old we will be, you know, when it will take place. And on our part, not knowing those things, to accept them in advance. To say to God, right here and now, I'm accepting whatever, whenever it may come, whatever may come, whatever the circumstances, I accept your holy will. Very pleasing act to Almighty God, very beneficial for the soul. So extra unction helps us to be resigned to the will of God and to receive it with the greatest fruit. One should make acts of faith, hope, charity, contrition, and that act of resignation. And of course, when we go to give someone extra unction, the priest always begins by offering, would you like to go to confession, um, to make that available as well. Uh, only a priest can administer extreme unction. Uh, it is advisable to call the priest to visit the sick in any serious illness. You know, we have the custom, and I haven't done it the last two years. Um, this last year, we had the COVID, and, and I'm talking about Easter time, April, May. Uh, so we couldn't do it this year. And then last year, I wasn't able to do it because uh, we we were just in the mixed midst of you know the getting moving into the new really remodeled church and getting ready for the dedication and all of that. It was just too much. But normally, I try to do this every year during the Easter season is to bless the homes. And somebody says, "Well, why do you do that? Because you've already blessed my home." And I and I tell people, "Well, there's several reasons why I do it. One of them is." It's an opportunity to connect with people because some people I maybe rarely talk to. You know, people go to the seven o'clock mass and then they leave right away. And, and I'm not out there after the seven o'clock mass. I, you know, if they don't have children in school or some, some other cause, 
or come to catechism classes, doctrine classes. I just, you know, some big parish, over 300 parishioners, and some people I just rarely ever talk to. So blessing the homes during the Paschal season gives me that opportunity, but it also gives me the opportunity to know where everybody lives and how to get there so that in an emergency I can get there quickly. So I started doing that back in the days before GPS. Now I got GPS, so it's not as, not as essential. But that was my original idea. I wanted to know where everybody in the parish lived. So if there's an emergency, I'm not, you know, hunting and trying to find where they live. I could get right there because I've been there. Um, and so that was one of the, one of the reasons. And it's also a, a, a custom of the church. There's a blessing in the ritual for a blessing of homes during the Paschal season. And in fact, when the priest blesses the baptismal water at the Easter vigil, it says that water is taken out for the purpose of blessing the homes. It's just a, you know, a, a, Catholic, a wonderful Catholic custom. All right. So visiting the sick, you know, when, when there's any cause, um, we take Holy Communion. We have a, we have a, a list of sick persons that we take communion to. I used to have about, nine or 10 people. And it's been pared down by people that have passed away, but also Father Gilchrist took over the ones in Coeur d'Alene for me. Um, so I don't do those anymore, but, um, you know, we're willing to, to visit the sick, sick parishioners in case of a sudden or unexpected death, should a priest be called? And the answer of course is yes, because if a person has died, we don't know for sure that the person is actually dead. So the person is dead when the soul leaves the body. That's when death takes place. The soul leaves the body. So doctors determine apparent death. The, the, the heart's not beating. There's no more, you know, breathing. And so they can say, well, the person is dead, but maybe the soul is still there. And so um, extreme unction can be given conditionally for several hours after, after apparent death. The, it appears, I mean by apparent, it appears the person is dead, the nurses or whoever, you know, uh, hospice people, whatever, doctors, they think the person is dead, but we don't know if maybe the soul is still there. So I would give it C vivis, which means if you are alive, I anoint you, etc. cetera. Um, all right, uh, we move on to the next sacrament. And that is the Sacrament of Holy Orders. And so, yes, we have enough time to co cover one more sacrament. And uh, I don't know what I did with my brown marker. Um, so this will only leave one sacrament, which is matrimony. And uh, that will be our next class. And there are a lot of things to cover with matrimony. So... Uh, good to give that a separate class, but we're covering today these two sacraments in one class. So holy orders is the sacrament by which men receive the power and the grace to perform the sacred duties of bishops, priests, and other ministers of the church. Now, um, holy orders, notice it's plural, orders, holy orders. So the orders in holy orders would be the three major orders, put it down like this, major orders, and then the four minor orders, and, you know, if you, the, the seminary is in Omaha, so we're not as much aware of it. Sometimes I'll put in the bulletin, if there's going to be maybe minor orders, especially if it's someone you know, put that in the bulletin. Um, but, you know, when, when you get a lot of people that go to a ceremony, it's when there's going to be a priest. So the, the first or the highest of the major orders is, of course, the priesthood. Under that is the deaconship. I'll just write deacons, deacons, subdeacon, subdeaconship, deaconship, subdeaconship. And... Um, and then, then we have the four minor orders, which are acolyte, the acolytate, acolyte, uh, then exorcist, and lector, and porter. And then under, 
under the four minor orders. So the first thing that's administered is called tonsure, clerical tonsure. And tonsure is not an order. It is a rite instituted by the church. And the bishop cuts the hair of the young man in five places. So right here in the front, the crown of the head and behind, and then left and right side so that it forms a cross. And uh, that's the first ceremony, official ceremony. And uh, a seminarian who is tonsured, who receives that ceremony, is now officially a cleric. So insofar as canon law, that young man comes under a whole different category because before he's tonsured, he's a lay person, even though he's a seminarian. He's been a seminarian for two or three years. He's a lay person. But once he's tonsured, he's now a cleric. So he's an ecclesiastic. He's in the clerical state. So that's kind of like the preparation. And then the four minor orders, and the bishop usually gives them in pairs. So the person will receive the first two and then the next two. Subdeaconship, we say, is the point of no return. Means a, a young man that becomes a subdeacon cannot go back to the lay state. He is obligated to pray the divine office for the rest of his life. He is obligated to celibacy for the rest of his life, um, uh, even if he were not to go on beyond that. So subdeacons, if you've seen a solemn high mass, that a priest has a solemn high mass, he's assisted by a deacon and a subdeacon. So the subdeacon would vest with what's called a tunic, and subdeacons wash the linens, the sacred linens, purificators and corporals that a priest uses. Um, so there's certain privileges, etc. Then there's the deaconship, and deacons can help distribute Holy Communion. They can baptize in necessity, solemn baptism. They can preach, preach sermons. Um, and then, and, you know, and they're preparing for the priesthood. And then, of course, a priest, the primary, as you well know, uh, duties of a priest and privileges of a priest are to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass, to absolve sins in confession, but also to give the other sacraments. So you'd have baptism, you know, Holy Eucharist penance, extreme unction, those four sacraments, and then also matrimony. Um, a priest also, of course, can bless, bless items. But I left some space because above these is the episcopate. Like uh, we were mentioning before class, St. Remigius was a bishop. So episcopate is, we say, the fullness of the priesthood. So we say that a man is being ordained to those uh, orders, but we say that a bishop is consecrated because he's receiving the fullness of the priesthood. So only a bishop can confer the priesthood and the other orders, and he's the normal minister, of course, of confirmation. Sometimes a priest, like in mission countries, may be given special permission to confirm, but the bishop is the ordinary minister of confirmation. Now, of these orders, these three, now you know that we talked about three sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. There are three sacraments that imprint a mark on the soul a character, an invisible mark on the soul. And for sure, though that character would be imprinted on the deacons, priests, and bishops. So, um, and it's not, even though they're different orders, it's one sacrament, but it's, you know, given partially or given part of the sacrament, I guess you might say, to deacons and to priests and then bishops. So we say the bishops have the fullness of the priesthood because a, a typical priest, you know, who's not a bishop, cannot make another priest, cannot confer holy orders, and normally not confirmation. Now, these below the deaconship, it's it's kind of a debated point. Were those orders um, instituted by the church, or are they from Christ Himself? We know that Christ instituted the deacons, priests, and bishops. In the Acts of the Apostles, you probably remember the story, one of the uh, first deacons. There were seven deacons that, that the apostles ordained. And what happened is there was a controversy among some of the early Christians about the administration of, you know, how people would, would donate their wealth to the church for the community. And so the poor and widows, etc., that were receiving the distribution some there was some grumbling by their relatives or whatever that this person received more and than that person and saint peter finally said 
it's not our place, the apostles, to get involved in this. So we're going to ordain seven deacons and give them charge of administering the goods of the church, as well as preaching and helping us in the ministry. So one of the first seven was, of course, St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church. Another one is Philip. And he was not the Apostle Philip, but one of the first deacons, who is mentioned several times in the Acts of the Apostles. So, so that comes from the Apostles, meaning by the will of Christ. So for sure, these. But these orders below deaconship, it's believed by many theologians that, that the church took the order of deacon and because the deaconship comprises all of those duties and responsibilities and privileges. So that the church, you might say, divided up those duties of a deacon. So typically, a porter means uh, keeping order in the church, opening and closing the church for, for mass and ceremonies, ringing the bell. Lector would be reading, reading in the church and especially uh, catechizing. Uh, things of that nature, but reading, like from the scriptures, that used to be di very difficult, take a lot of training, because they didn't have periods, etc. And they didn't have division into paragraphs and sentences. So you would have to, you'd have to know, you'd have to really study it and know where to pause and your inflection and so forth. Then the exorcist, of course, to exercise, to drive out the devil. Acolyte is the privilege of serving at mass, presenting the, the water and wine, carrying a candle, for ceremonies of the Mass. Uh, subdeacon, we already mentioned, especially washing uh, sacred linens. Subdeacons can handle the chalice. Um, and then the deacon, I mentioned preaching, baptizing, helping with Holy Communion, and then, of course, the priesthood. Now, typically, these uh, orders are received by men who are in the seminary, and their primary duty is preparing for the priesthood. So they're not involved so much in the... In the uh, privileges, I guess, of that order that would normally be done, you know, in some places where they were in a parish and they had certain responsibilities. Primarily, they're just, uh, they continue in the seminary studying and preparing for the priesthood. All right. Uh, what are some of the requirements that a man may worthily receive holy orders? Very important. First of all, he must be in the state of grace because it's a sacrament of the living and must be of excellent character. So you would want to make sure, and that's why you have seminaries, so that a young man is under the observance of his superiors to make certain that it's not just a fly-by-night idea to become a priest, that he, he demonstrates that he has acquired virtue and he's consistent in the practice of virtue. So you want to make sure that he has excellent character. Second, so that... Be in the state of grace of excellent character. Second uh, requirement, that he have the prescribed age and learning. So normally, uh, the prescribed age um, would be, for subdeaconship, uh, I think it's 21. 21 or 22. Deacon, it's 22 or 23. Priesthood, it's 24. Or at least 23 and a half. Now, you know, you read back like St. Remigius was ordained when he was 22. But that's many centuries ago. So those are the normal in canon law requirements. And a bishop must be at least 30 years of age and must at least have been a priest for five years. So those are the two requirements for that. Um, so the prescribed age and learning. So especially when it comes up to the priesthood. Uh, a man, no matter how many years he's been in the seminary, if he doesn't pass his exams and, and demonstrate at least a reasonable grasp of the disciplines, of the studies that he has to know as a priest, then he will not be promoted. So, and the same thing, you know, usually on the lower orders, there, there are certain benchmarks. And if the seminarian hasn't acquired, hasn't done well in his studies by a certain point, he might be put off receiving whatever order he is up to receiving. So second requirement, that he have the prescribed age and learning. Third, that he have the intention of devoting his life to the sacred ministry. Obviously, you know, the priesthood, once conferred, can never be taken away or never given up, never lost. A priest is a priest forever. And even if a priest, God forbid, were to abandon the priesthood, 
to return to the lay state or, or, or cease practicing the faith, whatever, he'd still be a priest in the eyes of God, would still have that awesome power of changing bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ and so forth, because thou art a priest forever, you know, it says in scripture. So uh, he must have the intention to devote his life to the sacred ministry. And finally, very importantly, he must be called to holy orders by his bishop. So we say that there are two vocations. There's the interior vocation and the exterior vocation. Because what does the word vocation mean? It means a calling, vocarius, to call in Latin. So the interior would be normally where a person, a young man, feels that being drawn by God. You know, that attraction. He, when he was an altar boy, he liked to serve mass, to be around priests. And you can just see certain things in certain boys that this seems like a call to the priesthood. But even if the boy has the desire, you know, a lot of little boys, they, their mother makes them little vestments. They like to, because they attend mass and they like to play mass, etc. And they, they aspire to it. And then as they get older, maybe they have the desire. But, you know, I spent two years with the bishop in Omaha and we had some that came and went and I noticed in a couple of them I could tell fairly soon on this young man does not have a vocation he had the desire he wanted to be a priest but he didn't have a vocation and that's the other aspect is the exterior external call the external call is the bishop calling him saying I want to ordain you. If you're willing to be ordained, you have a vocation. I approve of you being ordained. So that's the call from the church. The authorities, you know, the uh, a rector of a seminary, spiritual director of a seminary, the teachers, they can tell whether or not this young man would make a good priest or not. So that's the external call. And that's what it says. The fourth requirement is that, I'll read them again. What are the requirements? That a man may receive holy orders worthily, First, that he um, is in the state of grace and of excellent character. Second, he have the prescribed age and learning. Third, he have the intention of devoting his life to the sacred ministry. And fourth, that he be called to holy orders by his bishop. So no matter how much he wants to receive the orders, he will not be ordained unless the bishop approves him and calls him to orders. You know, sometimes it, it happens. A bishop, maybe oftentimes it might be towards the end of the end of the scholastic year, you know, there's a young man that's been there, maybe just his first year, maybe he's been there a couple years. And the bishop realizes this man is not called by God to be a priest and tell him, you know, you should, you should leave after the year is over, or whatever. Uh, you don't have a vocation. All right. Uh, and, you know, the, this is so true. The saying has been said many times, better to have fewer priests that are good and holy priests than to have an abundance of priests who are mediocre and may be a bad example. Because you don't, that can cause more problems, more harm than good. So very important to be very well trained academically, but also spiritually. Okay, uh, what are the effects of ordination to the priesthood? First, an increase of sanctifying grace. Second, sacramental grace, um, through which the priest has God's constant help in his sacred ministry. Third, a character lasting forever which is a special sharing in the priesthood of Christ and which gives the priest special supernatural powers. And of course, just like with baptism and confirmation, that character on the soul will, will never be effaced, will be seen in heaven or God forbid in hell. Uh, what are the chief supernatural powers of the priest to offer mass, to forgive sins? It mentions, um, why should Catholics show reverence and honor to the priest? because he is the representative of Christ himself and the dispenser of his mysteries. And then it mentions the bishop is the usual minister of holy orders. So that wraps it up. And I just want to think for a minute if there's anything else I might want to mention about holy orders. You know, we talk, especially, I bring this up to the women at our monthly meeting for the Confraternity of Christian Mothers. And that is the importance of prayer for vocations because our Lord gave us that himself gave us that means of obtaining vocations is to ask for them from God. Our Lord said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into his harvest. He's the one that sends them. And 
one thing, you know, we tell parents because parents have a desire, you know, to have a son or daughter become a priest, a religious, a sister, or brother, or whatever. Um, you can't force them. You can't give them a vocation. You can ask God to give the vocation, but God is the one who gives the vocation. So we should all pray for that. And as you know, we have done a number of things here in our parish to foster that. So now we started something new with the mothers of the confraternity of Christian mothers go up to the communion rail after mass on Saturdays and Sundays and say that prayer. And the prayer they're saying is from the wonderful pastor who started that in the little town of Lu, L-U, Italy in the 1800s. And this small town uh, between the time he started that, I don't remember, 1870s or so, up until like the 1940s, that town produced over 300, I can't, don't remember the number, 300 priests and religious, etc. But they would pray for vocations and they would pray that prayer in common. There's something about common prayer, which is why I wanted to add that. I mean, we had promoted that uh, prayer of the Mothers of Lou before, but then I thought, you know, as I was rereading the story, well, they, that, their pastor had them do that together. And there's something about common prayer. So that's one thing that we've done. Another thing, as you know, that we've had for some time is the pictures on the wall in the vestibule of, of course, there's myself and Father Philip and the bishop. But other than the three of us, everyone else that's on that wall was raised in this parish. And my criterion for that for like the religious at the Mount, the sisters to have their picture up there is that at least they were um, parishioners here during their high school years. You know, maybe they weren't born here, didn't grow up in this parish from, from childhood, but they, from the time they were uh, at least beginning high school age, going through high school, they were parishioners here. So the idea of having them up there, their pictures on the wall is to encourage people to pray for them because just because a young man becomes a priest or a girl becomes a nun, uh, a man, young man becomes a brother doesn't mean we stop praying. Wonderful that, you know, they recognize that vocation. They followed it, but now we need to continue to pray for them to persevere and to sanctify themselves in their vocation because we all benefit from them living their vocations. So that's another reason. And then of course, by our children, our seeing that would would be an inspiration to them hopefully to to bring about many more vocations so that you know that doesn't apply just to holy orders but of course especially to holy orders because we so desperately need priests uh and um that's something we all should pray for and and of course i i talked to the mothers about that about you know the role of parents is providing for the atmosphere Providing the atmosphere where if, and praying for it so that if God gives a vocation, it can grow because you've removed the detrimental uh, influences from the home. And there's the, the family rosary and those things that will foster the vocation. I told the mothers at our last meeting last month, my mother never, and, and it's hard to imagine maybe for you, she never encouraged me to become a priest. She never said anything. I just always wanted to from the time I was pretty young. And she was, you know, very supportive of that, obviously. But my parents never said, you know, you should become a priest, something like that. It was, they, they knew that I wanted to become a priest from the time I was young, but they never, the, the parents don't give the vocation is my point. God gives the vocation. And if the parents or a pastor talks a young man or young woman into it, they probably won't persevere because the vocation has to come from God. You know, we encourage them, but we especially pray for vocations. So um, obviously, Holy Orders is something very wonderful. When a young man, uh, you know, we have Brother Alphonsus now in the seminary, so someone from our parish and, you know, when he becomes a priest, to be able to come back here and offer mass, someone that you knew, I mean, obviously his relatives, and grandparents and parents, brothers and sisters, but those who remember him serving mass when he was a boy, etc. You know, it's, it's inspiring. It's a wonderful thing. So we're all part of, we're all part of the mission of the church to pray for and, and desire, of course, many priests and religious.